Hello and welcome to this session, which is a roadshow we've been taking around the UK on some investment breakfast. Sorry, you've not been able to join us for those bacon butties, but that doesn't mean you miss out on the content. Yes, it is political. And boy, is it political at this moment in time. If you're sat in the UK, uh, you are witnessing a transition of power from our former prime minister to the new prime minister, whoever that may be. I want to stress before we get into the slides, uh, this presentation was put together towards the back end of June uh, and early July. So Boris Johnson was our Prime Minister and hadn't yet resigned when we put these slides together. But we will update our one or two of the slides to account for the kind of tumultuous uh, political scenario that we're facing within the UK. Yes, it's political. Was a uh, was a, a track from Alm by Funk and Anstey in the uh, early 1990s. And that's a face that you probably look familiar at this moment in time. Probably a face that some of your clients are pulling based on the performance of their portfolios over the last six months. The performance of most asset classes has been pretty dire uh, over the course of 2022. Uh, we are looking at the industry's next mis-selling crisis. That's something I would come back to, but I just want to foreshadow that because if you will stick around for the next 20 to 25 minutes, we will give you a highlight on where we think the next industry mis-selling scandal is happening and probably one that you've potentially implicated in yourself. So please stick around and we'll talk about what's happening there. Maybe you'll be pulling that face yourself. So let's look at year to date returns. Um, first of all, we look at equities. So there wasn't many hiding places to be had. The UK was one of the few, I, I wouldn't even call it a bright spot, but it was a few place of refuge, safe harbor, if you will. Uh, within equity markets across the globe. So these are year-to-date returns to the 30th of June. Uh, and you can see they're kind of in local currency terms. Other than Japan, pretty much all markets are down 15 or even 20% in the case of the US. Now, ordinarily, if you look at returns over the last five years, when you've seen equities fall to those extents, and there have been previous instances of equities drawing down, over 10%. We had a situation uh, December 2018. Um, obviously, we all, all recall the drawdown that you saw in February, March of 2020 as the start of COVID kicked off. But in both of those scenarios, in a multi asset environment, in multi asset portfolios, when you had equity returns which looked as bleak as that, the other parts of your portfolio, particularly particularly your bond elements in your portfolio, they were showing strong returns using your flight to quality, a flight to lower risk assets. And as a consequence of that, in other scenarios, you'd seen strong returns on your bonds, which would balance out the returns on your equities, but not this time. So what happened this time is actually equities are not the source of your, of your concern. It's bonds and in the form of higher bond yields, primarily pushed by higher inflation expectations. Bonds are the real problem within your portfolios. And it's the weakness in the bonds kind of verticals and the weakness in bonds, uh, bond returns, which is pushing up on bond yields. Those higher bond yields are making people question about the rates of return that they ought to expect on the risky elements in the portfolios, particularly equities. And so at this moment in time, we've not really seen instances like this since the early 1990s, and prior to that, the mid-1970s, uh, where your bond element in your portfolio has been the cause of your concern, and those concerns have spilled over into equity valuations. And you can see that, you know, look at UK government bond portfolios, UK corporate bonds, emerging market debt and high yields, you're seeing rates of return which are commensurate with the drawdowns that you see in your equity portfolios. Now, all of those numbers are in local currency. So if we adjust now for a sterling-based investor and take a look at what that looks like in a uh, GBP-based portfolio, thankfully, and this is quite a perverse statement, but thankfully, due to the drops in, uh, in sterling over the course of this year, you've seen, if you had an internationally biased, biased portfolio, you've seen some of your returns and some of your losses ameliorated by holding foreign currency and foreign assets in your portfolio, given that sharp drop that you've seen in sterling over the past six months. So if you think back to that previous slide, the US market in local currency returns, uh, um, local currency basis was the worst performing global stock market. 
but if you convert those uh, returns into sterling, thanks to that almost 10% drawdown of sterling versus the dollar over the course of, over the course of this year, you can see your U.S. equity market doesn't look as bad as some other areas uh, around the world. And indeed, if you were holding U.S. Treasuries and U.S. Uh, government bonds, the combination of the Federal Reserve being slightly ahead of the pack when it comes to reacting to inflation in the form of higher interest rates. That had already baked in some of the interest rate expectations into US Treasury, uh, Treasury yields. And then on top of that, you've got a currency benefit to be had from holding dollar-based assets in the GBP-based portfolio. You can see that if you were holding US bonds within your portfolios, which we were at AJ Bell, that's been uh, a source of actually some positive returns in an otherwise bleak scenario. Now, I just want to focus in a little bit more on what's happening in the bond markets at this moment in time. And this will foreshadow some of that uh, mis-selling scandal that I think the industry will be faced with uh, in years to come, particularly if these returns, as we would predict, are likely to be persistent. So this curve that you're looking at at the moment is what the government bond yield curve looked like at the end of 2021. So as we came into the new year, you can see that practically across the entire curve, yields were no more than 1%. And yes, we were expecting some interest rate rises, but not material interest rate rises, so much so that a 10 years, UK 10 year bond yield was 1%, a 30 years was slightly above 1%, but practically all of the curve was below that 1% benchmark. Let's fast forward that six months, and what we've seen is an increase in real yields, but primarily an increase in inflation expectations as inflation has you know, burst, burst through the barriers that were previously seen as, as unbreakable, not dissimilar to, US, uh, to UK uh, temperatures. And as a consequence, if we roll forward just six months, you've seen a significant parallel yield shift upwards in UK bond yield. So almost across uh, all points on the curve, you've seen a similar quantum of increases in yields. But actually what you've seen is long, longer down the curve, so 20, 30, 50 years maturity is what you're, there, what you're seeing there is the yields have increased more than yields have increased at the short end of the curve. And that has a massive impact, a real significant impact, particularly in what we would consider to be low risk portfolios. So let's just put some numbers on that. If you are holding 30 year UK government bonds, so-called risk-free investments, so a 30-year UK government bond in just six months has seen a yield increase of 1.34%. That equates to a 30% loss in the value of that bond. So that just 1.3% rise in yields, given the interest rate sensitivity of bonds at the end of the marketplace, equates to a 30% loss in your capital value. And I hesitate to put the figures on for 50 years because some of you would fall off your seats. You've seen over 45% losses if you were holding 50-year uh, government bonds in the UK. Come down the short end, of, up, short end of the curve, so bonds with less than five years to maturity, what you've seen is, yes, you've seen a yield increase, but because those bonds carry less interest rate sensitivity in their price, what you've seen is a much, much reduced uh, loss in capital values. So almost a 1% yield increase on the five-year UK government bonds, but because they carry less interest rate sensitivity in the form of what we call duration, what you're seeing there is much, much lower losses uh, in, in portfolio values. And that's been a significant driver when you look at multi-asset portfolios, that's been a significant driver and a significant explanation of some of the variations that you've seen in performance returns. And of course, all of this is thanks to Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin invades the Ukraine in February of this year, and in doing so, brings conflict to Europe for the first time in kind of most people's living memory. Now, as a consequence of that, people pundits would tell you what we've created there is a situation with bottlenecks within the economy, um, concerns about access through ammonia, concerns about access to gas, et cetera, by the Nord, Nord Stream, and some of the kind of basic materials that are typically exported out of the Russian economy are across the world, and in particular into, into Eastern and Central Europe. 
the re restriction on, on those assets has led to runaway inflation and that's the cause of all the problems in the marketplace. Now indeed when you have a shortage of commodities and when you have a shortage of goods and services that will lead to higher inflation but I would contest the punditry that says that this is the explanatory factor behind the increases in inflation that you've seen. And some of you may have come up come to you know, our presentations in the past, may have seen me talk to about, about these guys, because these are the chaps who are responsible for your inflation. Now, I don't mean these four, gap, four guys um, you know, at a personal level, but the trousers that they're wearing are a great explanatory factor of how you ought to think about inflation and if you think about inflation in this way, we can understand how the inflationary pulse that we're seeing at this moment in time was very, very forecastable, and hence it's something that we position for in age of our portfolios, and also how you can see how it will persist longer than people have expected, but ultimately what the consequences are and what the roots are by which inflation will eventually cool itself down. So close your eyes. I'm, I'm trusting you to play along with it here. Close your eyes and think about the drain pipe. I want you to go upstairs in your house and I want you to turn your bath taps on. I want you to see the water come out of the taps. I want you to see it swirl around the basin. And I want you to see that water that's coming out of your taps disappear down your plug hole. Now, of course, as it goes down the plug hole, it then goes through your plumbing system. And at various points in that, in that uh, journey, it will find its way into the drain pipe. And now I want you to go downstairs, I want you to go outside, I want you to find your drain pipe in your home that you're living in at the moment. And I want you to see the water coming out of the drain pipe, which is directly related to the water that was turned on when you turned those taps on. So those taps represent money supply. And that money supply has been swirling around the economy and the pace at which the water is coming out of your drain pipe is how you think or to think about inflation. So you've got lots of water coming out of the taps and lots of water coming out of your drain pipe. So money supply, money is, was, and always will be the root cause of inflation. So that money supply is directly related to the inflation you see out of your drain pipe. But whilst you went downstairs, I sneakily went into your bathroom with a big car sponge, big yellow car sponge, and I dropped that sponge in your sink. Now that water is still coming out of the taps, but you downstairs looking at the drain pipe now only see a trickle of water come out of the drain pipe. And so you think that inflation and the water is no longer a problem. Clearly the water's slowed to a trickle upstairs, and therefore you don't need to worry about where the water and where the liquidity has found itself. And that's not been the case because what that big yellow sponge represents is asset prices and asset price markets. And so the money that's being created, primarily we started this experiment in 2009 in most developed economies, but boy, as we turbocharged that experiment in 2020 at the onset of COVID, we printed money. So in the UK alone, we printed £895 billion. Pounds. Around the globe, we've printed over $14 trillion with assets. That took taps on for blast. Now, the inflation didn't manifest itself in, in, in your drain pipe. It didn't manifest itself in CPI and RPI data because what it did instead is it swelled the value of all asset price markets. That's why bond yields got down to 1%. It's why equity markets have been on a 10-year bull run. It's why your property price is now about 10 times the average salary in the UK. So that money supply originally led to higher asset prices. It led to a swelling of asset price markets. And now what you're seeing is that money supply is still in the system and it's being wrung out of asset prices, which is why you're seeing it come down your drain pipe and smack you in the face in the form of higher CPI and higher RPI numbers, which are now 9, 10, and even 11% in the UK. Now, that model of inflation is how you ought to think about inflation. Most central banks do not think about inflation in that way. They use a model called the output gap. Now, the output gap model has proven to have failed. You cannot have an output gap model of inflation and create stagflation. And yet we've seen stagflation in the 1970s, and we're seeing, seeing stagflation right now. The output gap model 
is not the model that predicts inflation. And that's why most economists, most central bankers, and indeed lots of fund managers got inflation wrong over the course of the last 12, 12 months or so. If you have that mental model of inflation and you're monitoring money supply, you know that the only way that money supply gets back to more normal levels, and therefore inflation gets back to more normal levels, is we need to enforce a recession. And indeed, I would argue that the central banks at this moment in time, so we'll come on to it in a moment, at this moment in time, the central banks, if they stay on their current trajectory, are almost guaranteed to engender a recession, not just in the UK, not just in the US, but pretty much across most developed economies. Those countries that printed money over the past 10 to 12 years, they will all go into a recessionary type environment over the course of the next 12 months. That's something that's being priced into the market as we speak right here, right now. But not to worry, we have a, you know, a rambunctious prime minister to guide us through this stuff. Now, of course, when I put these slides together, Boris Johnson was our prime minister. He's not our prime minister any longer. And I'll reserve judgment on, on, my, uh, on, on my views on Boris Johnson. But what I will say for Boris Johnson is, for all of his critics, he, did, he was able to execute a plan. And so here's a plan that, that I think we ought to give Boris Johnson credit for. So this is from a speech in 2015, where the message here is, one option would be for the Bank of England to be given a new mandate to upgrade kind of uh, energy, transport, infrastructure, etc. Quantitative easing should be done for people instead of banks. Now, in 2020, that's exactly what we did. So you think of the furlough system and the um, self-employed uh, support schemes, etc. Some of the grants that the government gave out, that was money that was printed. And instead of, as it was in 2009, 2010, being pumped into the banking system, that was money that was printed and instead was given to real people in the real economy. So we can give them a tick for that. Another option would be to strip some of the huge tax reliefs and subsidies on offer to the corporate sector. Let's turn that around, i.e. let's increase in, uh, corporation tax. And you'll recall, you know, depending on what our new prime minister does, but you know, at this moment in time, there is plans to have an increase in corporation tax come through. That will raise, that corporation tax will raise about 18 billion pounds. We can give Boris Johnson a tick for that. And these funds could be used to establish a national investment bank to invest in new infrastructure and the high tech and innovative industries of the future. Anyone who's paying uh, attention to government policy will know that we do now have a national investment bank. So a national investment bank was created, capitalized by the government for exactly this purpose, to invest in the new infrastructure and new innovative technology and industries of the future. So Boris Johnson on all three cases there can be given a big tick for having executed that plan. The one problem is that plan was Jeremy Corbyn's campaign manifesto in 2015 when he was campaigning to become the Labour, Labour Party leader. And it was his prediction of how the economy ought to look in 2020. So Boris Johnson indeed has executed the plan. Unfortunately, it's been a plan that has led to largesse within, within, the, uh, within the government sector. It's led to a bigger state and so much so that you've now got tax as a proportion of GDP is again some of the largest figures that we've seen in living memory. He's been a very populist, he's been very nationalistic, he's been a very jingoistic prime minister, and the economy is bearing the scars of some of his actions. But of course, he won't be the prime minister going forward. Going forward, we will have a new prime minister. And this was a poll done just a couple of days ago um, by YouGov. Now, of course, you'll see at the bottom there, it's only 725 Conservative Party members who were polled over two days, 18th and 19th of July. And this was before we knew whether it would be Penny Mordaunt or Liz Truss who would face Rishi Sunak in the final, vo uh, final vote. Now, 725 from 160,000 Conservative Party members may seem like it's not a sufficient uh, survey size in order to make uh, accurate predictions. But well, however, 725 Conservative Party members, which is a relatively homogenous group, out of 160,000 potential Conservative Party members who will vote in the next Prime Minister, 99% confidence 
there's only a 5% margin of error on these figures. So at 99% level of confidence, we can say with reasonable certainty that Liz Truss's numbers will, be, will, will poll amongst the whole party somewhere between 49% and 59%. And so you are almost guaranteed at this moment in time, if this is a, a, you know, a reasonable survey and you could expect that this so it ought to be, you are almost guaranteed that Liz Truss will be the next Prime Minister. Now, anyone who was listening to the debates uh, where, where the candidates were on uh, ITV at the weekend, if you listen to those debates, you'll have heard Liz Truss's opening statement, where she uttered two sentences. But in those two sentences, she reversed the increase in corporation tax, she, increased, she reversed the rise in national insurance, tax, uh, national insurance contributions, sorry, and she also said that she would cut the green levy. In the space of two sentences, Liz Truss spent £40 billion. Pounds. £40 billion pound that will be need, need to be either uh, uh, balanced off with cuts in public, uh, public service expenditure, which I don't see, um, or alternatively, £40 billion pound that will be need, need to be raised by the, uh, by the uh, budget mechanism. And that budget mechanism, of course, is increased borrowing. Now, we are already likely to borrow £100 billion pound this year which will take UK national debt to £2.1 trillion, pounds, otherwise known as 100% of national GDP. So we now have a nation which is 100% debt to GDP ratio, and potentially a prime minister who seems to have thrown off the shackles when it comes to any form of fiscal discipline, and is happy to increase those fiscal deficits by about £100 billion pounds or more, for the rest of the next two years in an attempt to effectively bribe you for your vote as, a, as an electorate when it comes to the general election in presumably, presumably two years' time. So that's something that I think you absolutely need to be aware of, particularly in the context of some of the things that we'll talk about now. Because whether it is Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak, the next Prime Minister will be faced with some extremely difficult choices. And one of those choices is whether or not the environment is a luxury good or not. We've seen in various instances in the past, when times get tough, people become tribal. And when times get tough, your luxury goods are typically jettisoned. Now, at this moment in time, given the commitments we made in COP26, and given some of the legally binding requirements on the government to face up to uh, kind of its, its attempts to get to, to net zero, the environmental bill of going to net zero by 2050, which is the plan in the UK, will cost trillions of pounds. Because the environment, the transition in energy that we're asking people to undertake here, requires massive subsidies. Every other energy transition that humanity's ever made, from whether that be from transitioning to burning wood for heat, to transition to coal, from coal to oil, from oil to gas, Every one of those energy transitions led to a more efficient way of producing heat and producing energy. This will be the first energy transition in the history of mankind that goes from an efficient energy source to a less efficient energy source. And therefore, in order to compel people to do that, we need to provide incentives. And those incentives at this moment in time are coming in the form of government subsidies. Give you a great example, if you go to the US at the moment, and you buy yourself a Tesla, $9,000 of the price of your Tesla is sub subsidized by the US government. Now, over the life of that Tesla, that Tesla will remove about four to five tons worth of carbon out of the atmosphere. And you might legitimately say, okay, well, think of the billions of cars around the world. So you multiply that four, you know, four or five tons by a billion, and you've just reduced four to five billion tons worth of carbon out of the atmosphere. But you could offset that carbon in the carbon offset market. Four to five tons worth of carbon would cost you about $200 to offset, and yet the US government is currently paying $9,000 in subsidies in order to make the offset. And that's just one example of how governments around the world are having to bribe and subsidize people in the electorate in order to make an energy transition which goes from an efficient energy source to a less efficient energy source. Now that was fine when the economy was doing, doing well, 
And then you could legitimately say, well, it was promoting new technologies, new industries, and new job creation. And indeed, all of that is perfectly balanced up. But those subsidies will become increasingly harder to justify in a tougher economic environment. And so one of the problems that the new PM will face is whether the environment is a luxury good or an absolute staple that we must prioritise. But either way, there's a fight coming there. And that fight will find its way into the UK, manifesting, manifesting itself in even greater concerns for sterling. We have the biggest current account deficit in the whole of the G20. We've just posted the worst current account deficit figures in UK economic history. The UK currently operates on a current account deficit of all over 3% of GDP. Now, 3 to 4% current account deficit as a proportion of GDP is a figure you would typically associate with an emerging market country. And it's only by virtue of the UK's history, you know, we, we created the Industrial Revolution. So the UK's got 250 years worth of history behind it, 250 years worth of heritage, 250 years worth of trust in sterling, what used to be the, the, you know, the global reserve currency. That history and heritage is giving sterling a free ride at this moment in time. But in a, in a politically unstable environment, the UK's current account deficit could really come to bite us hard, particularly with a nationalist-style government whose message seems to be, your money is welcome in our country, but you're not. And in an environment where you're trying to raise 100 to 150 billion pounds from typically foreign investors in order to fund your current account deficit and in order to fund your fiscal deficit, that's a really difficult message to be putting on, on the global stage. And also at a time when you're potentially kind of waxing lyrical and taking, taking a shotgun to international law as well. These things all come together in a political environment where you could legitimately see significant further falls in sterling, almost to the point in this kind of the, the area that we, that we would put it in as a ballpark. The euro recently reached parity with the dollar. Do not be surprised to see sterling reach parity with the dollar at some point in the next couple of years without some form of change in our political environment or our economic environment. That's the trajectory that we're on. And if you're running a UK, if you're running portfolios on a multi-asset, multi-currency basis for UK sterling backed investors, that's something you absolutely want to factor into your portfolio construction. Here's another slide that's out of date. And indeed, the first time that I present, presented the slide, I did actually say that presuming that both of these people would still be in their jobs in years to come, this is a, probably the single biggest risk to your portfolio as a UK investor. And that risk is the independence of the Bank of England. So let's do a little bit of a history lesson here and remind ourselves of how the bank got its independence in the first place. So cast your minds back, if you will, to September 1992. And in September 1992, the UK fell out of the exchange rate mechanism. When, you were, when you're part of an exchange rate mechanism, when you peg your currency to another country, you effectively import that other country's monetary policy. So in September 1992, the UK found itself overnight with no monetary policy whatsoever. And so what we had to do is we had to quickly cobble together some form of economic plan and some form of monetary policy. Now this was fortunate because a couple of countries, New Zealand, Canada and Israel, had just started their new experiment thanks to a paper that had been published in the US, which was setting interest rates in order to hit an inflation target. And so the UK became the fourth country in the world to adopt an inflation target. So in 1992, it was an informal target, and it was set between the Chancellor at the time, who was Ken Clark, and the Governor of the Bank of England, so that, that was Eddie George. Those two people ran that situation until 1997, when, when Labour came to power, one of the first things that Gordon Brown did is he gave the bank independence of setting interest rates in order to hit an inflation target. And at that moment in time, interest rate policy transferred from the government into the Bank of England, where it's been ever since. And in the 25 years since 1997, inflation has averaged around 2%, so top marks of the Bank of England. However, 
that's been in very benign conditions and conditions that have not really been tested. We are now about to go through the Bank of England's greatest test of all. And the Bank of England, if they are true to their mandate, ought to be raising interest rates, not at just 25 basis points at a time, but 25, 50 basis points, probably to the point where UK interest rates ought to be somewhere between two and a half and three and a half percent in order to quell the economy, in order to bring inflation down. Now imagine we set interest rates not from where they are at the moment, one and a quarter percent, interest rates got to three to three and a half percent. UK government bonds, 10 year government bond yields get to four percent. 30 year government bond yields get to four and a half percent. Think of the sum of the losses that you saw earlier on that slide and think of the decimation that would lead to your, to your fixed income portfolios. And in our view, whilst that ought to be the right policy response, you cannot look at economics in isolation without understanding history and also understanding politics. And so the reference that we're making on this slide is, there will come a point in the cycle where the Bank of England, and in their desire to quell inflation, will come against the government's ideas of what's right for the economy and what's right for the electorate. And if mortgage rates get to three, four, five, five and a half percent, the squeals from Middle England will be so loud and so long that they will lobby their they will lobby their parliament in order to take that independence from the Bank of England. Now, this is a significant risk. Such a significant risk that you absolutely need to be thinking about this for your corporate construction. Because if that were to happen, the anchor that's been created on inflation expectations over the last 25 years will be set free. Inflation expectations will become untethered from that two to two and a half percent anchor. And what you could expect to see is significant rises in long end bond yields to the point that a 30% loss on a 30 year bond might look like child's play. And this is a significant risk so much so that I would argue it's the single biggest risk that you face in your multi-asset portfolios and potentially the next mis-selling crisis within our industry. So this is a balanced portfolio. This is returns on balanced portfolios from some kind of big names that you'd, that you'd recognize over the course of the past six months. And a typical 60-40 portfolio, a typical portfolio has dropped by 10 to 11%. That's for a balanced kind of mandate. But we know not all of your clients and not all investors adopt a balanced mandate. Particularly, there are some investors who are more cautious in nature. And those cautious investors, not only have they expressed the desire for their portfolio to be more cautious, in large parts of the industry, they've not just expressed any desire, they've sat a psychometric scientific test to demonstrate how uncomfortable they would be if their cautious portfolio suffered from a significant drawdown. And so if we look at cautious portfolios over the course of the first half of the year, you will see the returns on cautious portfolios in the first half of the year have been worse than the returns you've seen on a balanced portfolio, which have been worse than the returns that you've seen on adventurous portfolios. The risk appetite and the risk return trade-off has been turned on its head and that may not be something that just only happens for a six month period. If we get into a world where the Bank of England independence and other central banks independence is challenged, inflation expectations will become unanchored. Those, that, that untethering of inflation expectations will lead to large yield rises at the long end of the bond, bond market. And as a consequence, those, those losses that you've seen on fixed income portfolios in the first half of the year might just be the start of a longer going trend. And so kind of my, my, my beg of my plea to you as a listener here is, if you are running multi-asset portfolios, please, please, please take a look at how the fixed income positions within your portfolios are, are positioned. And I would beg and please that you make ensure that if this is a, a scenario that you can buy into, and hopefully we give you some reasons why it's a plausible scenario rather than something that's completely out of left field. If it's a scenario that you buy into, you absolutely want to make sure that the bonds within your multi-asset portfolios are at the short end of the yield curve. And that's a, that's a kind of a position that we hold within the AJ Bell portfolios, which is why 
you know, it's one of the reasons why the age of our portfolios have been better performing versus the vast majority of our peer, peer groups over the course of the last six months. And as a consequence of that, you know, our longer term performance, yes, if you look at our five year performance, there have been small instances when bond yields have been falling where we may have slightly underperformed from our peers. But we were always of the view that the market's expectations for inflation were too, uh, were too sanguine. We felt that we understood how inflation gets created to a better extent than a lot of our competitors who use our book cap model of inflation. And the, in, the Miss Dallin scandal that you're potentially looking at here, and why we're particularly uh, kind of concerned about this for more cautious portfolios is, you now have a cadre of, of, of clients on your client bank who have told you that they're cautious, you've scientifically assessed them to be cautious in, in nature, and yet they're potentially looking at drawdowns in their portfolio of over 10%, and potentially maybe as high as minus 20% over the course in a, in a single 12 month period. And those clients, I almost guarantee, will make complaints. And those complaints, you will legitimately kind of fend off those complaints with, you know, kind of, we told you what a cautious portfolio would look like. We told you the risks associated with the course of portfolio, but some of those claims will find, find their way to the ombudsman. And anyone who's spent any time with the ombudsman will know that in, at times, the ombudsman's decision-making process might not necessarily always follow a set degree of logic. This is potentially the industry's next, next mis-selling scandal. Cautious clients complaining about the returns on their so-called low-risk portfolios. And so I beg and plead you right now, have that in mind, assess your, your uh, portfolios, and just ask the question of your multi-asset manager, how are you positioned for a scenario where you see not just a small rise in yields that we've seen in the first six months, but a continuous prolonged rise in, in fixed income bond yields? And there we have it. That's an assessment of where we see the market at this moment. It is incredibly political at this moment in time. Economics is taking a back seat. This is all about politics right now. And so you absolutely need to be across the news, need to be across the political kind of complex, and you need to be thinking ahead of what are the choices we are making as a nation, what are the choices that other nations are making. I'm sat here presenting this on a morning that uh, Mario Draghi has just resigned as the, as the uh, Prime Minister in Italy. So political risks are absolutely front and centre in your multi-asset portfolios at this moment in time. Be cognizant of them, think of some of the scenarios that could play out, and please, please position your portfolio accordingly. Thanks for listening. Hope that's been of use. And if you've got any questions, pop them to your sales representative and we'll be sure to get back to you. Thanks very much.